Uh, let, let me just respond to something that one of the prayer requests um, this morning. And, and brother, your prayer request touched my heart. Because that's a cross that Christian parents carry. When you raise your children in the faith, they know, they've heard, and yet they make choices that break your heart. And um, it's always on your mind. It's always in every prayer request. And it, and it never leaves. And you do pray without ceasing because you're constantly whispering up, Lord, I can't do this. You're going to have to do it. Um, reminded in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 15, and that is not where we're going but this morning, but it's a great passage. Um, and Jehoshaphat was facing an enemy that there was no way that they could win. <clears throat> There's no way they could defeat this enemy. There was more of them. They were warriors. They, they knew how to fight. They knew how to kill. And Jehoshaphat was not out, humanly speaking, to the task. But they did something. They prayed. And they brought the whole family, their families before the Lord, and they prayed. And Jehoshaphat was reminded in, in chapter 20, verse 15, and I don't want us to ever forget this, that the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. Amen. Amen. If you make something your battle, you'll never win it. Right. We cannot talk anybody into faith. We can't convince anybody on human terms or human arguments how or, 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 or try to defeat them in, in intellectual combat. It's not going to happen. Only the Lord opens the heart. Amen. And so do not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, we will reap if we do not quit. Amen. And so the Lord makes all things beautiful in His time, not ours. Amen. And there's a, lot of, uh, this, there's a lot of young people that have come to the Lord after their parents have already gone home. Now, I hate, I mean, that's just honest. Because the word of God never returns void. It always accomplishes what God wants. Amen. You believe that? Amen. Then we don't have to live in defeat. Even when the enemy comes and whispers in your ear, it's too late. They'll never change. Whatever the lies he throws at us that causes us to lower our shield of faith, you raise it back up. Ah, oh, Lord God, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too difficult for you. Amen. End of story. If he can drop the apostle Paul in the dirt, he can drop anybody. Amen. Amen. That's, that's what we need to look. We don't need to look at the battle, but look at the one behind the battle. It's not ours. It's not ours. It's his. You're welcome, brother. Well, this passage that we're going to be on today, and, and I think maybe, I don't know if I'll get through. I've never written so many notes, so I don't know what time you guys eat lunch. Um, I'm just kidding. I, uh, it just weighs heavy on my heart. Um, the question I have for you this morning is, how many ministers are here this morning? How many ministers are here? There was an article written many years ago by Moody Monthly. It was published about a church in California. And the title of the article was The Church with 900 Ministers. Now you think, my gosh, how big was that church that it needed 900 ministers. When someone comes up to you or you're talking to someone and they say, I'm in the ministry, well, what comes to your mind, typically? Oh, uh, where, are you, where are you pastoring? Or, or where are you serving the Lord? What church are you in? What, are you a missionary? Are you, what, what, I mean, you're in the ministry, what do you do? 
Well, I want to ask you to really think about something this morning. I want to, I want to challenge the Western church thinking and get back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? That has to be the final authority. Amen. Question again, is there a minister in this church and it's not me? When I ask you, is there any ministers here this morning? Typically, we think of the pastor or pastors or a, a, a term, an, an unbiblical term, is it clergy? Somebody who's got the collar turned backwards in some denominations. Whatever it is, they're, they're, they are the minister. And once we start thinking that way, please listen to me, we will gut what the New Testament says a church should be. One, one man said we become, we watch a professional pulpitism financed by lay spectators. We watch somebody else do it. We, we pay you to do that. Whoa. That kind of thinking will kill a church. And, and when I say kill it, I mean that church still might be here. They still might open the doors. They still might have people sit in the pews, but they are of no effect. They never grow up. And when you have a church like that, they come up with gimmicks to try to get people to come to the church. And so I want us to look at a passage this morning that's probably one of the most, uh, one of the most powerful passages in the New Testament as to what a church should do and be. By the way, let me finish that article that was in Moody Monthly. It was way back in 1973, and this is what it said, and some of you will, will know the man of which I speak. The real distinctive of the church, this church that had 900 ministers, was a hunger for biblical preaching. John MacArthur was the perfect pastor to whet the appetite. There were two pastors before him. It had gone on who set the foundation. The church growth accelerated almost immediately, and it was not just numerical growth. Important. Grace Church soon developed a nationwide reputation of being a congregation that took the Bible seriously. So many of the people became active in hands-on ministry. That, in 1973, Moody Monthly published the feature article about this church, and it titled the article, The Church with 900 ministers. That is a New Testament church. The church is not known by its minister. It has to be known by its ministry, made up by the people in the church. If the church is only known by its pastor, it's missed it. It's missed it. And this morning we'll look at a passage that shows that how many ministers are here? How many ministers are at Charlestown Road Baptist Church? How many do you want? I hope you are not got the thinking in your mind that we need to find us a minister to fix us. You're Christ's church. He'll build you. You need to find a pastor, biblically Qualified, and those are some things that I hope you know what your Bible says about that, and the role of a pastor so you don't get it wrong. Because if you get this wrong and come with Western tradition, you'll kill them. You'll wear them out. There's some churches that only have a pastor and it rotates like a ro rotating door in a supermarket. They only stay for a certain number of years and then they leave. Because the church wears them out. Or because the pastor is just a shallow guy who comes with 24 sermons and goes through them and then he leaves. And there's people like that. So I want to challenge you this morning at the place you are as this church to make sure what you do, you do by the book. 
and you know the book. You need to be a Berean. What is a Berean? The Bible says that when, the, when they were preached to by the apostles, that they went home, searched the scriptures themselves to make sure what was being told to them was true. You need to know this book that you can search it yourself. I don't know about that. I'm going to go back to the Bible and see what it says. Or, yeah, that's right here. That's right here. And it's in context. That's what you need to be, a Berean. Search the scriptures to make sure what's being told to you is true. So, again, how does a church get to the point where it has a a boatload of ministers in the church? How does this happen? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul, usually in his epistles, started with the first half of the book in doctrine, and then he would come up and say, verse 4 has the first word, therefore, based on this, this is how you then live. The same thing with Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, based on the doctrine of the first 11 chapters, now live this way. Paul always had a therefore. And so you and I, right here in this passage, having already had our position described in Christ, what it is and who He is and how we're loved and gifted far beyond what we could ever comprehend. Now, therefore, and you go down and He begins to talk about some things in there, and we're going to skip down. There's so much here, and I hate to even skip, but for the sake of time this morning, we'll do that. Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 7. But unto you, or to on every one of you, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he says, or saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now you'll see a parenthesis there. We're going to skip down to verse 11. Okay, we're just going to skip that part right now. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, that's verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11 in Ephesians. Some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto a mature, unto the mature measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That Henceforth, we should be no more children tossed back and forth or to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Whoa, there's so much there. And there's so much uh, that I'm not even going to be able to... Uh, get to this morning. One of the things I want you to understand this morning is this is the best job description of a pastor in the Bible. Amen. There are many other ones that shed light. By far, it's not the only. But what sometimes when you, when you have a, a church, and it could be a Pharisaic church, a legalistic church, which, it, which cuts its own lifeblood, by all the rules and traditions that it creeps into its constitution. It's not even in the Bible anymore. But you can hand your, your, the, your prospective pastor a, a job description, and a lot of those job descriptions aren't even in the Bible. Where did you come up with this stuff? And what it does, again, is it adds extra biblical uh, uh, criteria that makes this man almost like he's walking Jesus Christ himself. He, he can, no one can do all that. Nor were they designed to by the Lord. So and I'm not saying this is that church. I'm just saying there's a lot of churches that, that cut their own throat ministry-wise because of their expectations and unbiblical expectations that they put on the man that is to bring the message so we see here, 
verse 7, it says he's gave gifts to the measure of faith. Now, this is something, again, I just, I'm just going to reference this. Again, everybody in here has been given a gift according to the measure of grace. Everybody in here has something that was divinely given to you at your salvation. It's your responsibility to find out what that is so you can be part of the body, a healthy body of Christ, giving your gift. By the way, there is no age limit. It does not expire. I want you to understand that. There is no, you get to serve until you're ex. There is no retirement from ministry. As far as, a man can retire from the pulpit, but he doesn't retire from ministry. You understand? He just changes, he changes his deployment. And the same thing here. I, I, I've heard uh, through the years, and I guess I understand it to an extent, but it's not biblical. Well, I've served those many years. Let somebody else do it now. I understand that. What that could mean is I'm so burnt out because nobody's helped me. I don't want to do it anymore. It's somebody else's turn. I hope it doesn't mean I've served the Lord, I've loved the Lord, and now I'm just going to step back, I'm going to sit in the bleachers, and I'm going to watch somebody else do it, and I'm not going to do it anymore. I hope it doesn't mean that. Because if it means that, it's unbiblical. Because nobody retires from ministry. What you do, maybe you're not front lines anymore, but you will always be a mentor. You understand? If you've been there, done that, help somebody else to be there and do that. You, you have to pass the baton. To get out of ministry with the level of knowledge that you have and the gifts that God has given you and the experience you've gleaned over the years and to pull back and let somebody else start over is not even biblical. And you can go to first, or Titus chapter 2 for that one. And it's right there. So we notice in verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor and teacher. Do you notice that there seems like there are five categories, but only four sums? <laughs> or your translation might say end. The reason is, is because there are only four. That word end doesn't have the word some or, or um, in front of it. In other words, he gave some specifically apostles, some specifically prophets, some evangelists, some pastor. What it really means is pastor teacher. You can have the gift of teaching, but this is talking about gifted individuals given to the church for a specific purpose by the author of the faith by the one who said, I will build my church and I'm going to send certain people to do the work I want them to do. Now, this is a pastor, teacher. This is the only place in the Bible this word is found. Pastor, translated. And it really should be shepherd, teacher. Po poimen is, and I don't know Greek much. I mean, I, I can throw a little bit, but I, I don't know much. I wish I did, but I don't. So it's translated 18 times in the New Testament, and almost every time is shepherd or shepherds or shepherding. This is the only place it's pastor. By the way, it's the only place that evangelist is mentioned here as well. It's the only place in the New Testament. So these men, this pastor teacher is for today. The evangelist is for today. And I want you to understand, um, Ray Stedman put it this way, just so we can kind of get a clarity of it. I like, he's a great guy to tap into. The first two, apostles and prophets, are concerned with the originating or expounding of the word, while the last two, the evangelists and pastor teachers, are concerned with applying the word to individual lives. The evangelist deals with the beginning of the Christian life, while the pastor or the teaching pastor is involved in the development and growth of that life. In other words, the, the, the evangelist today might be a missionary 
who goes into a place where the word is never heard, never been heard before, and they got that unique ability to draw people to the Lord. They've been gifted by God to, to share the word in such a way that people come to Christ. They help those churches get established. They can move on, and they establish pastors. That's why Paul told Titus, not, not very important, when you look at the qualifications of leadership, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. They're a little bit different, and there's a reason why. When he told Paul or Titus in the in the island of Crete to ordain an elders in every city as I have appointed you, in other words, go to the cities, go to local churches, ordain those pastors, ordain those, and it's the same word, they're interchangeable. The word overseer, bishop, uh, pastor, elder in the Bible is always an interchangeable word. They always mean the same person. They might shine a different light on the responsibility. So they go there, he ordains elders in every city. This is the kind of guy you want, and then you move on. There are no deacons mentioned in Titus, although there are in Timothy, and it could be because of the maturity level of the church. But I want you to understand that the, the pastors were to come in and begin to perfect the saints or teach the saints. They, they are, they do have their role. Now, you notice again, God gave, or, or the Lord gave, and that's important too, because the Lord not only gave us the Holy Spirit, He gave us men that come alongside with being used by the Holy Spirit to begin to teach. So, by the way, this word evangelist, I want you to understand something. And, and, and this is one of the things that I want to uh, address. An evangelist, when we think of an evangelist today, we think, well, that's Billy Graham. Or, 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 or you, know, yeah, we, you know, we think of somebody like that, and that's true. But that wasn't these guys. Uh, an evangelist isn't somebody with seven suits and seven sermons who comes into a city, stirs up things, and then blows out. No, they, they were somebody who planted themselves in a local church. Their primary responsibility was add to the church. Now, and here again, you, when you study the scriptures, know what it says as much as what it doesn't say. You know what I mean? The evangelists want people to Christ. They, 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 they got the foundation going. The pastor teacher came along and began to build up. And the evangelists did that too, but to build up or perfect or equip that person for ministry. The, the, and sometimes we get to the point where the reason the church is not growing is because we don't have a good pastor. Now, Maybe, but maybe they just don't have any evangelists. Or maybe the evangelists that are in the church aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Everybody's supposed to, by the way, do the work of an evangelist. Every believer has the Great Commission. Do we not? That word go, therefore, wasn't given to a select few. It was given to us all. We all need to be involved in that. At whatever level the Holy Spirit has put you in. So the growth of the church comes from this, this process where you can get to the place where this church is filled with ministers. That's the goal. That's what the Lord wants. All right. <clears throat> um, we're going to do a Bible study this morning, and uh, so we're going to turn to different passages. That's probably why I won't get done. But I want, you to, to, I want you to be a Berean this morning. You got your Bibles or the Bible on your phone? Got your good Bible app? Whatever. Let's, let's, turn, let's turn to John. John, familiar passage with, with us, John 21. John chapter 21. All right, let's start with verse 15. <clears throat> So 
So when they had dined, Jesus said to Peter, or Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Do you love me more than these? By the way, it's interesting to look at the different words of love that's used. Sometimes it's agape, sometimes it's a friendship love. Do you really like me a lot, Peter? He even questioned that. So he's questioning the Peter's love. And Peter said, he saith unto him, Lord, you know that I love you. And he told Peter to do something. Well, what did he tell him to do? Feed my lambs. If you love me, do something about it. Feed my lambs. And you know this drill. He goes on and he says, Simon, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep, or the word there is tend. It's a little bit different, but it really is basically the same thing. Oversee, watch them, pay attention to them. And then verse 17, he says the same thing. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was kind of grieved. Lord, you know all things. You, you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Now, the word feed there means to continually feed. Don't stop. One of the things I want you to see is the word my is used three times. You're not going to be the Pope of the church, Peter. They're my sheep. Keep your hands off of them. Don't mess them up. Feed them. They're mine. That is an awesome responsibility. When you look at what a pastor shepherd to do is to do, is to feed, that's why it's called shepherd, is to feed and lead the sheep so they can grow. Amen. By the way, the sheep eat themselves. The pastor, the shepherd doesn't shove grass in their mouth. You get that? You can have a shepherd who can really teach the word of God and there's green pastures. Man, there's so much here. There's so much meat. And you just sit there, mm-hmm, 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 and you don't put one blade of grass in your mouth. You won't grow. You won't grow. Now, let's go on to verse 12 of Ephesians. Turn back. We're going to turn to other passages. You know, I have to, just a side note, uh, I'm always concerned that I preach too long. And when you get up here, you get to the point where when I start hearing myself, I'm preaching too long. And so I'm, I'm not quite there yet. But what I never noticed was there's a doggone clock right there in the back. I mean, there's your sign. So um, I, I can do better now. <laughs> Yeah, that's right in front. Of it. Yeah, that's right. In front. Huh? God's got it on your heart. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the clock's on my heart, but you're right, brother. I, I can't uh, be. I can't let the Holy Spirit uh, or cut the Holy Spirit because of the time. Now, verse twelve. This is really important, and, and the reason again, I, I just want to keep uh, restating this fact is because I want you to know your place and your role in the body of Christ and to know what the pastor's role is. And don't put your role on the pastor's role. And the pastor shouldn't put his role on your role. Everybody has a gift. Do it. And when you do what God has called you to do, it works. Unbelievable how that works, but it works. It, it absolutely works. Now, he gave these guys... To the church, it says, for the, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Perfecting, good, good old King James word, which simply means maturing. There is nobody who's going to be perfect. We're never going to be, but we will be perfecting. This is like we, there is nobody will, that will ever get to the walk in, as in Christ that they will ever be sinless. 
but we can get to the place where we sin less. You see, so we're in the process of perfecting or growing or maturing. It's we are doing that as we grow up. So the pastors and the evangelists come alongside, they perfect or they mature the saints for what? Why, why do they do that? Why does that have to happen? It says for the work of the ministry, for the building up or the edifying of the body of Christ. If he put back up, if equipping doesn't happen, what happens to the work of the ministry? Well, it doesn't. It struggles. What happens to the, the church building itself up in love? And, and that's the big thing. A church that encourages itself and build itself up. You love that. You love to hang around the brothers. You love to hang around the, 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 the brotherhood, the sisters in Christ. You love those fellowship dinners where you get to hang out and talk about things and share your life and do life together. And you build each other up. Exactly. So, who does the work of the ministry? How many ministers are here? The pastor is not the worker of the ministry. He has a ministry right here. If he can't do this, you can't do that. If, if, he, if he has so many rules and regulations placed on him, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying you do that. I'm just saying there are churches who, and, and I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of Baptist churches who are good at killing pastors. Not just Baptists. It could be any denomination, but I'm just speaking from experience. When you do things the Bible way, it's funny how it works. It's funny how it flows. One time I heard something that's really, really important. It comes to this when you're, when you're calling men here. If it's of the flesh, it's forced. If it's from the Spirit, it'll flow. Please remember that. When you want the Spirit to lead your decisions, you want the Spirit to lead you in your life, if you have to push open the door, you probably shouldn't have gone through it. If it's of the Spirit, it will flow. And you're walking in the, the will of the Lord, and His Word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Guess what I can see? All the snares of the enemy. So, very important, for perfecting of the saints, for the building up of the body of Christ. Again, when a church says that there are 900 ministers in it, they have 900 ministering people who are loving and serving and, and, and evangelizing and building up and involved in home Bible studies and, and, and training little kids, and they're just doing the ministry. And they don't have to come along and say, a, a pastor, organize something for us. Start something for us. No. How do you know God's leading you? Because you can look at the congregation, you can think, oh, we, we sure could use that. We, we need this. I'll go to the pastor and tell him he should start it. If it's on your heart, maybe the Spirit's leading you. You can get advice. You can get counsel. Absolutely. But if it's on your heart, you do it. Well, I don't know how to do it. Exactly. Without, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. That's why he gets all the glory, because he takes people who are imperfect, not by might, the Bible says, but by power, my spirit. So he takes a church, he fills it with his spirit, he gives them the word of God, he gives them pastors and teachers, and they perfect and they grow up. And when you grow into maturity, you grow into knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ at a different level than you've ever been before. And it just chain reacts. And of course you can't do everything. You have a measure of grace. Max it out. And one of the things that will cut 
cup ministry in this church and any church is when your measure of grace compares your, your, your to another measure of grace and, well, they've got more of grace, so I'm not going to do my part because they obviously are more gifted than me, so I don't have to do it. Nope. No, no, no. I have a hand. This little finger doesn't do much. It doesn't help me pick up things like the thumb and the first finger. But man, I need it. It's part of the hand. And so you might say, I'm just a pinky. Oh, you fill your, fulfill your ministry. Max, I don't, do not compare yourselves to somebody else. You just say, Lord, speak. Lord, use me. And that's what a pastor teacher does. He helps bring that into maturity. The pastor is not to be the chief evangelist of the church. He is not to evangelize the church over and over and over again. Every sermon is an evangelistic sermon, John 3.16 or Romans 6. Or, well, it's not over and over and over so that you hear nothing new. You grow. No, that's not the job. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. We gather to learn. We go forth to evangelize. The church is seen out there, not here. If you think evangelism is only going to happen here this morning, you're wrong. You need to look into the New Testament. You are light and salt out there. Out there for a reason. So you grow up. And when you grow up into Christ and you become more, Romans chapter 8, you, you know, why do all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose? And you go on in the next verses. For whom He did foreknow, He predestinated to be conformed unto the image of His Son. The whole reason you were saved and I was saved and this church is here so that you can grow up into the conformity of the image of Christ. And when that happens, do you possibly think a church would not care about evangelism? Do you think we could grow up and have the heart and the mind of Jesus Christ and not care a whit about lost people? No way. It's impossible. So a church that doesn't care about winning the lost or doesn't care about supporting missionaries or doesn't care about teaching uh, young people or teaching adults or whatever, men's, whatever it is, that's not a, a church that's developing into the image of Christ. It's just not. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Well, I got a feeling this will probably be, I got so much more, which is good because I've already got next week's. <laughs> Acts chapter 20, this is great stuff. I just, this is good. This is one of those verses that shed light. And there's a few other verses we might go to, I, I might go a little longer, but I promise it won't be long. And by the way, um, I usually have about three or four closings as I wind down. So <clears throat> if I say in conclusion, that doesn't really mean that. It could be my, my first in conclusion. Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Great, great verse. Take heed to yourselves, therefore. I'll start over. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There it is again. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, who are these people? They're from the church of Ephesus. Turn back to, to verse 1 of chapter 20. You're in the book of Acts. Let's just get who these people are. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed into Macedonia. And when he had gone over the parts, um, so he called the disciples and embraced them. So these people are those who follow Jesus Christ. They are, some places you even see the overseers, are the elders of the church at Ephesus. So again, that you, it's an interchangeable word. 
when you have an overseer and you have an elder, it's the same shepherd idea. Take heed to yourself, pay attention to yourselves in the whole flock. Watch yourself. Take heed to yourself. And then also watch the flock. Now, how many of you remember the Christmas story when the angels appeared to the shepherds who were doing what? Walking in their flock by night. They weren't first shift shepherds. They didn't punch out. They watched. And what are they watching for? Angels? They're going to be here any minute. No, they're watching for wolves. They're, they're, they're on purpose. They're watching the sheep so that somebody doesn't come in, thieves or robbers, as, as Jesus said, or, or wolves who creep in, not sparing the flock. So the Holy Spirit made you an overseer to do what? To feed the flock of God. Now look at this. How important is the church? How important are you? He bought you with his own blood. Don't ever forget that. That's why the church isn't any one man's church. Uh, I don't know. That's why, personally, a senior pastor's parking place, <laughs> I have a problem with that. I really do. What? Where did that even come from? That's nice. But that gives in the mind of the church, he's more important, he's reverend, he's this, and look, he's a part of the body. You know, we respect him, we follow their leadership, but please understand what the Bible says. We were given shepherds to feed the flock of God that God purchased with his own blood. How important is this? How important is this church? You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. We don't get to run the church the way we want to. It's not the pastor's church. It's not the deacon's church. It's not the one who gives the most money. It's not their church. It's not the church of the one who's been at the church the longest. It's not their church. It's Jesus Christ's church, and he bought it. Makes him the owner. Makes him the fixer. He knows, he knows this church, Revelation chapter you know, when he, uh, 2 and 3, when he looked at the churches. I, I know you. I know you. And so he knows this church. And so please, don't ever take for granted the importance of a church to Jesus Christ. I have to read this. There's a song that just penetrates my heart every time I hear it. How deep is the Father's love for us? How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure, a great the pain of Syrian loss. The father turns his face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Listen, I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. 
This I know with all my heart, that Jesus Christ bought the church with his own blood. How important is it that we model what the New Testament says a church should be and do, that the world may see Jesus Christ. John 17, don't ever forget this. And there's so much here I'm not, and they're about the unity of faith till we come to that and, and we'll go into it next week. But it says in John 17, verse 23, Father, I pray that they may be one. Why? So that the world may see you sent me. Father, I, it doesn't say, Father, I pray that the pastor would be powerful, on fire, just be able to, to, to really bring it home that the world may see you sent me. Father, I pray that you'd really bless the gifted speakers that the world may see that you sent me. No, he said, Father, I pray that they may be one, that the world may see you sent me. Church, when we grow up into full maturity and we become into the fullness of the stature of who Jesus Christ is, the world will no longer see a man. They'll see a church. And when they see the church, they'll see Jesus Christ. That's the goal. The whole thing, the whole dynamic of growing up into Christ of having pastor teachers, of using what God has given us. And we're going to look at that next week. To bring about the maturity is not so we can get puffed up by our knowledge of the Bible. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. We don't get a big head. We show Jesus Christ. That's it. Church, how are you doing? Are you growing up? Are, are you still seeking God? Are you still wanting to know Him? Here's my second closing. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Pursuit of God, which I highly recommend that you all get that book. He's got some other good ones. You can get it online, and you can actually listen to the book online. In The Pursuit of God, in the uh, preface, he says this. There is lacking today, or there is today, no lack of Bible teachers that can set forth correctly the principles of the doctrine of Christ. We've got a bunch of them, he says. But too many of these seem satisfied to teach the fundamentals of the faith year after year. Strangely unaware, there is in their ministry no manifest presence, nor anything unusual in their personal lives. They minister continually to believers who feel within their breasts a longing which their teaching simply does not satisfy. I speak in love. But there is in our pulpits, or the lack in our pulpits is real. Milton's terrible sentence applies to our day with accuracy as it did in his. The hungry sheep look up and are not fed. It is a solemn thing and no small scandal in the kingdom to see God's children starving while they are actually seated at the Father's table. Church is important that you do not find a pastor who can give you goosebumps as good as goosebumps are. That you can get a pastor who can get some tears to flow as I said before, I'm a crier. I get emotional. But that doesn't mark a successful service. 
that doesn't mark a maturing church. Get somebody who can feed. And when you get somebody who can feed, eat. Grow up. It's not about you. It's not about the pastor. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we've really looked into the Word this morning and seen the passages that, and it's just scratched the surface of what the ministry should look like. Lord, there's so many things that can call us off. We can begin to walk by sight and not by faith. We can try to come in and try to fix things and get three of these and two of those and, and try to organize something that shouldn't even be organized. It's by your Spirit. Lord, we know that you're not the author of confusion. Everything should be done decently and in order. You have given gifts and gifted men. Lord, it's your church. Help this church to get an insatiable hunger to know what a church can be when it grows up into the fullness of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the men who've stood in this pulpit before me, and Steve, who faithfully taught the word of God that this church might grow up, that the people might mature into Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that this week that you give us, each one of us, an open door to share Christ. Father, I pray that we would look to you when times are rough, Father, I pray that we would go to the Word as a lamp unto our feet. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort us. You are the God of comfort. Father, I ask that you would just lead, guide, and direct by your Word and by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As we